Today, my topic is focus on some of the simplest possible problems we can use a deep neural network to solve, which is fitting a 1D function from data. So it's a conventional numerical analysis problem, but I will state it in a little bit different way. It's to find the interpolation of these n data points in a function space h parameterized by theta. So let me give you an example. This h can be a space of polynomials. And specifically, we consider m equal to n so that we can find, for any data, we can find a unique function in that space so that it goes through each point exactly. However, we know that this pro th these algorithms suffers from the uh, Runge's phenomena, meaning that it goes through each data point exactly. However, it somehow it can overfit the data with some like this kind of artificial oscillatory components. So some conventional wisdom to deal with this problem is to consider a much smaller function space, yes, uh, specifically with m less or much less than n. So we may not be able to fit each data point perfectly, but we can avoid overfitting. OK, now we have an uh, alternative, which is to use a deep neural network. It's operate in a region with m much larger than n, meaning that we are considering a much larger function space. Is it a modern wisdom? We will see. So because it considers such a huge function space, we know that there are infinite many functions that can fit this uh, data point perfectly. So which of them does the neural, deep neural network find? Let's first look at some empirical results. So we can use deep neural network of different layers. So, and these solid lines are the solutions found by deep neural networks. I ensure you that these, all these deep neural networks can easily represent these kind of oscillatory functions. However, it just seems that it prefers not to find this one, but these kind of more smooth or flat one. So before we go into details, let me first talk about the, some basics of the deep neural network. Essentially, deep neural network is a complicated model of many parameters. It can be used to model or fit any input-output relations. So it has V4 layer structure. So for each of these previous layer, you go through a linear transform plus a bias and go through this static nonlinear transform. You get something on the ne next layer. So its parameter space, thus it's a collection of all these weights. Uh, distributed over different layers. And a simple example is a two-layer neural network. Why we always consider it? Because it has universal approximation ability, meaning that as its weight s goes to infinity, it can approximate uh, any continuous function to any desired accuracy. OK, now we understand what kind of model it is, and we consider a very large function space parameterized in this way. So how does the neural network find a specific function in that space? OK, it, it's very simple. It's just through this gradient descent dynamics. And this loss function is just the L2 arrow function. And if there's any preference of the deep neural network, that should be hidden inside this dynamics. So, but naively speaking, this dynamics tells you nothing but just it try to find the theta that lead to a deep neural network fit each data point exactly. So therefore, if there's some preference inside this dynamics, like some people use a word like implicit bias. So to study this dynamics, we have two trajectories we can look into. The first one is definitely a trajectory in the parameter space. So another one, which I feel is more important, and we may have more tools to deal with, is a trajectory in the function space. And later, I, I will talk about this in detail. So OK, later I will focus on the question of how DNS fit a 1D function. I will study these trajectories of H HXT through the lens of Fourier transform. I will tell you the phenomena we found and effective model and some analysis related. So what, what is the T here? Is the T just part of the dynamics with the gradient? Yeah. So you see that this is, <laughs> so essentially, 
you run this dynamic, which is in the theta space, and you put this theta inside this deep neural network because it's a parameter of the deep neural network, yeah. and then you get this one. Yeah, I just tried to remove this theta, but essentially, because of the evolution of this theta, you get the evolution so you, of are H. You, are you writing down the theta, theta t or? Uh... Yeah, so first you evolve this, you get a theta t. And then you put this theta t in this okay. model, okay. you get hxt. Yeah. OK, so let's take a look at the evolution. OK, probably you see something. It first learns some coarse grain structure, and then refine them, and find this kind of refined structure. So but let's look. Yeah. In that animation, your activation function is like You mean this function or activation function? No. The activation function is just uh, rectified linear. So it's very low. Yes, yeah, it's very low. Um, Otherwise, it won't be able to like, uh, or it's a like it's a different story, but we are focusing on ReLU activation function. Sorry, but then if this ReLU, shouldn't the function always look like a two-sided function? No, that's not right. Later you will see. But once you see Gibbs phenomenon, no issue. Uh, just a little bit, but not se severe. That's not, it's a, it's a different from Gibbs phenomenon. Yeah. So, okay, let's look at the same trajectory, but now through the lens of Fourier transform. Please pay attention to these frequency peaks and when these peaks are captured. OK, from this picture, it seems that there's a very clear order of conver convergence. So this lower frequency one first converge, and later the high frequencies. So essentially, this kind of phenomenon is general or universal for the deep neural networks. And we call this phenomenon frequency principle. Essentially, DNs often fit target functions from low to high frequencies during the training process. OK, so to quantitatively understand this phenomenon and to understand its implication, we derive an effective model. So essentially, I call it linear F principle dynamics. It is derived from the two-layer neural network of this form. We use ReLU activation function. And we have some assumptions. Important one is this width S is sufficiently large so that we can have some mean field treatment as well as some linearization of the dynamics. So this is a dynamics we got. And here, you can see very clearly this F principle because these terms which governs the evolution or the rate of evolution of different frequencies is decaying as a function of frequency. And yeah. I just don't want to get lost because it's very interesting. Um, yeah. This function h, that is definitely a two-sided linear function. Yeah. Yes, but you use kind of, you can think of like infinite many. OK, but in your animation, yes. what's the width of the network? The width of the network. So th that is moderately large. So I do not require this S really to become infinity, because it's uh, just sufficiently large. And you will see that these uh, effective dynamics holds. Uh, but in the animation, the function yes. was piecewise linear. I just didn't see because the pieces were very small. So it depends on what kind of scale. So if you have so many neurons, you, what you observe is essentially a ReLU function. ReLU function, actually, like, actually, kind of, so it's a probably plus b. You have some row, probably. OK, so this kind of distribution will kind of smooth this ReLU function to get a function of a little bit higher regularity. So that's why, although it's piecewise linear, but if you have many of them, you cannot see a piecewise linear because it's a kind of 
because at the limit, you get something of higher regularity. That's super cool. But in your animation, you would definitely find it with waste, right? Uh, yes, it's a finite waste. Uh -huh. So, but, but you see through your eyes, uh -huh. you can't distinguish. Okay. Yeah. OK, so. OK, this is the dynamics we get. So this is a power law decay. This power law decay comes from the regularity of this ReLU function. If we give something more smooth, for example, tench, we get something like exponential decay. What, what is ReLU? ReLU is this function. Oh, OK. Yeah. You see that it uh, has some this kind of kink points, this, which gives you these power law decay terms here. OK. So this term not only tells you the frequency principle, but also gives you some details like what's the rate of that. So this dynamics <coughs> is not so trivial in a sense that here you plug in some empirical distribution, which is summation of n delta function. So this term only uses the information at the data point, not other where. So because of that, we may see this aliasing phenomenon. Essentially, at some finite data point, there are two different frequency components that completely overlap with one another. So that these two, the evolution of these two frequencies in that setup will correlate with one another. Yeah, because usually, like this kind of data are kind of non-uniform distributed. So this correlation can be very complicated. Yeah. So that's about these dynamics. So what does this dynamics tell you about the what kind of function it finds? To directly see this, we need to convert this dynamics to an equivalent optimization problem. So this optimization problem, you can directly see what's the exact meaning of the preference of the deep neural network. It's essentially this norm. This norm is a weighted L2 norm in the frequency <coughs> space. Because of this inverse, it actually increases as the frequency increase. Essentially, it tells you that uh, it gives higher penalty on this high frequency mode. So, and from this optimization problem, we immediately get two regimes. The first regime is when this first term dominate. Uh, I may forget to tell you about this meaning of this term. So, these actually are the variance of the initial values of these parameters. You can change the, like, these variance, initial variance, and then you can change the relative importance of these two terms. So when these first terms dominate, uh, what you get, you can write it back to the spatial domain. You get this optimization problem, which gives you a piecewise linear fitting. And if the second term dominate, and then actually you got a cubic spline. <coughs> Let's see whether this prediction holds for the real case. OK, in reality, we can change the, uh, this kind of initial variance of these parameters. And we indeed get some piecewise linear function here, and which blue curve is from a two-layer neural network of, of these 16,000 neurons. So, and here you get something of higher regularity. You can, it probably is uh, like if you really zoom in, it's piecewise linear, but you cannot see it from your eyes because you have so many neurons. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, from that we can say something about the generalization. You don't need to read this, but it just tells you because of this norm here, which magnifies this component at high frequencies. It says that if the function you try to fit is some low frequency function, then deep neural network can fit well. If it has some very high frequency mode, then the deep neural network cannot fit it very, very well. OK, so now let's, based on all this result, let's look at the initial problem of how neural networks find a good interpolation of this data in this huge function space. Essentially, we can see that this initialization of the theta and also this regularity of the activation function 
through this dynamics is converted to the some requirement of specific regularity. And for me, what is the ultimate answer to the deep neural network? It should be some mathematics that explains, for example, architectures. Actually, it's a very, very difficult problem. And optimization algorithms, how all of these, through this dynamics, is converted to something with specific structure. And definitely, we know that this specific structure should contain some of this specific regularity. But we know that probably more than that. So we are still far from answering that question, but we are making steps. OK, so the final piece of information is deep neural networks love low frequencies. And this work is in collaboration with my colleagues, uh, Zhiqing Xu, Zhen Ma, and Tao Luo. And we have a serious work on this topic. Yeah, thank you.